next session and that's the pre-lunch session. But I'm sure Dr. Jagadish, uh, Professor from JIPMER, will make it very interesting because, you know, this is again more and more questions will be asked. At least we'll have some one or two questions uh, in the theory as well as quite a lot of discussion in the vivas on some of the radiotherapy advances and, you know, some of the techniques that we use commonly in patients who require multimodality treatment. So over to you, Dr. Jagadish. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv. Um, so uh, you had quite a long session today, and I'm st just standing before lunch for you people. So I'll try to be as brief and complete as possible. And before I start, I would like to know about the audience parameters. How many are, of you are from non-radiation backgrounds? So I just need to know. Fine, quite a, quite a lot, actually. Fine. It's fine. So I think my presentation will be useful to you. And for those who are from radiation background, I can see some phrases. It will be just a refresh of whatever you have learned. And probably you had not learned in these three years of your extra training. Fine. So this is the outline of my slide. I'll try to finish off in half an hour, probably by 1.30. So I'll be covering upon the definition of radiation, what radiation actually means. And radiation is a whole lot of uh, stuff. But under which, what is therapeutic radiation? How do we use such radiation in treating cancer? And then I'll talk about a tip radiation treatment course, how long does it take, and what are the parameters in completing a full radiation treatment course, just as you complete a chemotherapy course or a hormonal course or any other treatment course in cancer. And then I'll be talking upon the different technologies that have come up in the, over the years, since the era of 1950s over on to 2010 and 2015, where we have got DART techniques. I'll be talking about all the IGRT, IMRT in brief, so that you can know the concept and gist of it. And then I'll be talking about a bit about SRT and SBRT, and then techniques which are commonly used in treat, treating cancers, which you'll be doing routinely, so that you can have an idea about what toxicities happen in your patients when they receive chem uh, radiation as part of the treatment course. In lymphoma, breast, and sometimes whole brain RT in a CNS or in a metastatic setting. Also, RT techniques in myeloma. And then I'll be touching upon brachytherapy, which is a form of radiation treatment, and uh, other uh, radiation treatments that are commonly used in sync with treat cancers that are treated by both medical oncologists and uh, I mean the curative regimens from medical oncology side. So T is total skin electron, total body radiation. And then finally, the radiation accompaniments, which are usually the toxicities or any uh, side effects, adverse effects, which we expect in a routine course of radiation. And then I'll be talking about, if I have time, probably I'll just touch upon the biology and the physics of radiation aspects. And what is therapeutic radiation? Radiation basically means any, uh, any, any energy particle that propagates in space. And uh, energy particle that sits doesn't mean radiation. It has to propagate in space. And then out of all the radiation that propagates in space, we don't use every one of them. Just like an ultrasound or, an MR or, an, uh, or a radio frequency ablation waves. We don't use all of them for treating cancers. We use specifically those that can ionize the medium. That means which can produce ions inside it. By producing ions, they can effectively kill the cell. That's what it means, basically. So this radiation can be broadly classified. Therapeutic radiation can be broadly classified into particle-type radiation or wave-type radiation. So particle-type radiations are all quite uh, known to you. Protons, heavy ions, electrons, any atom, basically, that can ionize the medium. And then wave-like radiation is part of the electromagnetic spectrum, specifically X-rays and gamma rays. Cosmic rays and others are not tamed by human beings, so we cannot use it effectively for treatment of cancer. So just, just electromagnetic spectrum among which the high frequency ray, high frequency waves which basically throw out more energy which can ionize the medium are used in our treatment of cancer so the a conventional treatment course how does it how, how does a typical radiation treatment course in management of any solid tumors look like um, because radiation mainly does curative treatments in only solid tumors I'll be covering the most common solid tumors so what we do before starting radiation treatment we want to locate the tumor site where exactly you, we can locate it using just a planar X-ray or two-dimensional images or using CT PET scan or MRI scans, which gives out a three-dimensional information. Once we locate it, we demarcate the region on the body. So basically on the skin or uh, another plastic which we keep on the patient, and then we can try to demarcate the location. And the demarcated location, uh, it's, the radiation is being thrown onto that every day over a period of time. It, the typical curative radiation course goes on to around six weeks to eight weeks. Whereas a palliative or other, sometimes even radical causes can range between one to few days, depending upon the techniques which we follow. So this is just a basic immobilization technique which we follow. Because we are going to deliver radiation again and again over a period of time, the patient has to receive same radiation to the same site so that the target tumor is not missed out. And also, 
the normal organs that are beside it should not be unnecessarily exposed to. So this is just an immobilization mechanism, a plastic used on it, and then the doctor, uh, radiation oncologist, trying to mark over the body where exactly radiation has to penetrate into the body. Fine. So this is basically, I'm giving you an example of a uh, carcinoma service, which is the most common gynecological malignancies among uh, rural women. So uh, cervical cancer is diagnosed and using biopsy and other, every stuff. This is approximately the surface anatomy of the uterus and then the cervical tumor sitting right behind the pubic symphysis. So using an x-ray we can easily identify, of course we cannot see where exactly the tumor is. Using clinical examination we can locate that probable site of the tumor. So it becomes easy for a radiation oncologist to demarcate the field where he needs to throw, throw radiation to kill the tumor. So of course you need to throw radiation to this tumor site. We also treat the entire uterus during treatment of cervical cancer and all, we also treat the lymph nodal zones, the internal iliac, obturator nodes and the pelvic nodes up to the common iliac junction. Fine. So this is how we use a two-dimensional information to plan a simple radiation treatment course. So of course the border blackened areas, this picture basically shows, this is taken from a computer, fluoroscopic uh, simulator. This picture basically shows the entire field the area where exactly radiation is going into the body is enclosed by these limits. It's not that the entire viewed field is receiving radiation. It's basically, we have an ex increased the uh, viewing information for you to understand it better. So basically, all those that is enclosed by this rectangle is what is, is where radiation is being thrown upon. We try to block all the unnecessary areas. These are all primitive blocking techniques which we use in a typical simple radiation treatment field. And this simple radiation treatment field, treating fields are much more than enough than complicated techniques like IMRT or IGRT, probably that are used only in selective cases. So here we are able, comfortably able to uh, cover up the nodes, the primary tumor as well as with an adequate margin. So this box is basically kept to shield all the small intestines that are going to come into the field. And this is basically kept to shield the femoral heads and the neck which can have a deleterious uh, effect later in after treatment course. This is another uh, common cancer, head and neck cancer. It's a oral buccal mucosa cancer and this is a tongue cancer, base of tongue coming onto the lateral. So here we shoot radiation obviously to the primary site as well as to the neck node which is also the possible site of involvement. So we can shoot radiation laterally on both the sides and then for the neck we can uh, shoot a radiation directly anterior onto it. Choosing the face is what the radiation oncologist tries try to do. The, uh, the requirement rules are he needs to choose a direction in which only the tumor is seen and the or other normal organs are not usually seen. If they are seen, then he'll have to optimize the directions. That's what basically means. So after you have done everything, put the patient onto the treatment couch. It can be a cobalt room or it can be a uh, linear accelerator room. The idea is you need to throw therapeutic radiation. It can be an X-ray, it can be a gamma ray, electron, anything. There are certain differences in choosing whether you need to do an electron or we need to do a photon using X-ray or gamma ray, which is beyond the current discussion's perspective. Here, if you can see, I have shielded this region and this region in two lateral fields, which basically sh basically shields the brain. The rest of all the regions are all target sites for oral cavity cancers as well as the oropharyngeal cancers. So this midline shield is kept to shield the spinal cord. Of course, level six nodes might be shielded in this treatment mechanism, but most of head and neck tumors, level 6 is at very low risk of involvement, level 6 nodes. Level 6 are typically involved in medullary cancers or thyroid malignancies, for which we won't keep this shield. Coming on to the other most common cancer which you will be also treating is breast cancer. Breast cancer radiation is part and parcel of the entire treatment regimen except for the early diseases or probably for the metastatic diseases. So all locally advanced patients have their surgery done or probably before, with or without neogen chemotherapy and then come on to us. We try to place another immobilization cast just as we did for a cervical cancer patient. Once we place the immobilization cast, the target, or, the target region after mastectomy or a, whole, uh, or a lumpectomy is usually the breast site or the chest wall tumor bed. So we are going to sh shoot radiation to this region. We can shoot it direct, either directly, direct uh, anterior field onto the chest. But if you do a direct anterior field, it is going to go through the lung, sometimes into the heart and then onto the spines. So we choose a tangential uh, direction, a, a direction that is tangential to the curvature of the chest wall, which is what is done here. Sorry. So we throw radiation from the uh, right uh, medial tangential and right lateral tangential for a left breast. And this is what it looks on a uh, X-ray film. So the part of the curvature of the uh, uh, chest wall along with a, a bit amount, quite a good amount of lung. So we'll have to be careful in not exposing too much of dose to the lung. So this is a typical technique and this, let's see, this photograph, ex, uh, radiograph shows radiate, radiating the lymph nodal region. Basically it covers the level two, level one and supraclavicular nodal zones. This is a direct half-face field. So we are throwing three different fields, 
two tangential fields to the chest wall area and one anterior field onto the uh, neck node area. So these fields probably are, are not useful to you or probably your examiner may not ask you. But then the only thing which is required for you is to know more than what the examiner knows about all this. So if you can manage that, it becomes easier for you. Fine. So this patient is lying on the treatment couch and this is a cobalt treatment machine. This is a typical cobalt treatment machine. Here the radi radiation comes from a natural or, or artificially created source. So that means there is no need to switch on the machine on and off. Radiation is always on. One only thing we need to do is remove the shield off and then replace the shield on. So this is a quite an economical uh, way of producing radiation because this can be used without much electricity or at the maximum a limited amount of electricity with a gen generator. So we can run this uh, treatment machine even in remote villages where we don't have good amount of electricity. Sorry. This is a linear accelerator. So this requires a lot of electricity to the, to the amounts of even 10,000 or 1 lakh voltages, just as you see in uh, Jurassic Park fence, which will be running in thousands of voltages. So we are using in terms of that to produce high energy of a radiation, which can, as it passes, it should be able to produce lots of ions, which can kill the cells. Fine. So now coming on to the broad overlay of treatment techniques. Whatever I had described is a typical radiation technique using X-rays. When we use only 2D planar information to find out the target site, which is, it is called a conventional two-dimensional radiotherapy technique. This is more than sufficient to treat all the major solid tumors in India, which is head and neck cancer, cervical cancer, and breast cancer, without producing much toxicities. Only when you go on to treating abdominal tumors, thoracic tumors, or brain tumors, we need to have much more refined technique, uh, which are all this. So the idea of, in fact, the entire category can be put together under the common title called three-dimensional conformal radiation treatment. Conformal because we are trying to shape the beam instead of having a standard rectangular or a square field. We are trying to produce irregular fields so that we target exclusively onto the tumor and not any other organ at risk. OAR is a term which we use commonly to refer to all organs, normal organs that are situated by the side of the targets. So this. If you need, uh, I mean, the technologies have developed in such a way that we are able, since we are treating the same patient over a period of time, we need to be very precise. Precise in the sense we need to have high precision, high repeatability. When you treat the same patient again and again on the same, uh, on multiple days, you need to treat the same target. So that is what is precision. And that precision can be achieved when you re-image the patient every time on the treatment couch. So today you treat the patient based on the CT scan or an X-ray which you have taken. Next day, you again take another CT scan or an X-ray to make sure the patient is positioned in exactly the same position as on day one. So that technique is what is IGRT. So you can use CT scan to locate the target site onto the treatment table every time, or you can use a simple X-ray, or you can use uh, ultrasound or other infrared mechanisms for the same purpose. So IGRT basically increases the precision of the treatment, radiation treatment protocol. The other two techniques, IMRT and VMAT, are techniques which increases the accuracy of the radiation treatment. Accuracy in the sense, only the tumor receives radiation and not the OARs, organ at risk, nearby organ at risk. Such techniques are basically uh, comprised over uh, IMRT and VMAT technologies. The next two techniques, stereotactic techniques basically, as the word stereotactic uh, suggests you, with the abilities to perform an IGRT and so in, a, in other words, with the ability to have a high precise technique as well as a highly accurate technique, we are able to throw radiation only to the tumor and not to the OARs. So such a scenario is beneficial from reducing a treatment course which runs over weeks on to just few days. So because we have got much higher technology, we can treat, we can cover the entire radiation dose on a single fraction, which will be called a stereotactic radiotherapy, or at the maximum over two to three fractions. In a single week, you can cover the entire treatment protocol. That's what SBRT means. SRT is mainly focused on the cranial regions. SBRT is stereotactic body radiotherapy. Any part of the body can be covered by this technique. And finally, we have a newer technology, which is dynamic adaptive radiotherapy. So as we start the treatment on day one, as you know, radiation and chemotherapy produces log cell kills. In other words, a portion of the tumor gets killed every time when it is get, getting exposed to a cytotoxic treatment. So over a period of time, as I told you, a typical course runs over six weeks. If you shoot radiation on day one, you'll be shooting on the entire big volume. And the next day, it probably shrinks down. When it shrinks down, it can even pull in normal organs that are being displaced by the expanded tumor volume onto the original treatment volume. So thereby, you're unnecessarily irradiating more of normal tissues as the tumor responds more and more. So this brings in another problem that we have increasing uh, adverse effects as the tumor, in, in fact, 
for radio sensitive tumors, you will have more of toxicities than radio resistant tumors because the size will always be the same. So to uh, counteract such a scenario, we call a dynamic radiation technique, which is basically you replant the patient when the tumor has significantly shrunken. So you don't do the plan, I mean, you don't do the treatment based on day one image. You repeat the image probably quite comfortably every week or every two weeks, depending on the radio sensitivity. If you expect the tumor to respond beautifully to radiation, it is better to re-simulate, or the word re-simulation is used to replan basically. So this typically happens in a germinoma. When we treat germinoma in the CNS region, all the, the optic chasma is quite very close to the germinoma tumor. Once we shoot radiation, it shrinks very beautifully over within two, three fractions, and then optic chasma comes into the field. So if you don't redo an image, you will wrongly presume that you're treating only the tumor. When in fact, you will be treating the entire dose goes onto the optic chasma or of the optic nerves. So that is where dynamic adaptive optic comes into play. Obviously, all these are possible because we have got IGRT techniques, IMRT and VMAT techniques that have come up only in the last three, 10 years with good amount of data. So this is just to show you. This is a CT built onto the linear accelerator. This is what we have. So this CT scan is used to re-image the patient every time when the patient sits on the couch for treatment so that we know the patient is lying down on the same exact position. And this is a robotic arm, which is a cyber knife. It uses X-rays from the ceiling, basically, to locate where the tumor target is. Of course, X-ray alone, a planar X-ray alone cannot see the tumor. So you need to have markers placed, sometimes just a radio-opaque markers placed inside or a radio-frequency marker that can be placed by the surgeon before starting the treatment protocol. This is a tomotherapy machine, which is exactly similar to a diagnostic CT machine, except that instead of diagnostic X-ray, we are throwing therapeutic X-ray. The difference is diagnostic X-ray is, uh, is of very low energy, which does not ionize the medium usually. So therefore, it does not kill any cell that it passes through. In fact, if it kills, then we wouldn't be doing any amount of diagnostic X-rays on normal pa or apparently normal patients, fine? So th this one has an inbuilt CT scan in itself. So which means this is an IGRT enabled linear accelerator. That's what tomotherapy means. These are all different technologies, imaging mechanisms, which are used to find, locate the tumor every time when you put the patient on the couch again and again for treatment. You can use ultrasound to locate the position of the tumor. You can use KV, uh, just an X-ray image, which is what is done in a cyber knife. Or you can use an X-ray image uh, detector that are placed right opposite to the treatment beam. And you can just place radio opaque markers or radio frequency markers, which you can use to track the movement of the tumor. This is especially useful when the tumor moves a lot. This is typically in a lung cancer patient, where you insert the markers into the borders of the tumor, where you can track the movement of the tumor. Accordingly, you can shoot radiation. So CT on rates, basically you have a CT scan inbuilt opposite to the treatment machine. So patient on, uh, on any particular treatment day lies on the couch, the couch moves over onto the CT machine, takes a CT scan, and the same information is used after the patient moves back into the treatment machine. So this is a CT scanner, this is a treatment machine. Couch runs between, that's why it's called CT on rails. So and tomotherapy, as I told you, it has an inbuilt CT scanner. This is a typical linear accelerator with a built-in CT scanner onto this. This CT scan is not so perfect as a diagnostic CT scan because what we need is only the position of tumor. We don't want to know the characteristics of the tumor, whether it is uh, highly radio-opaque or, uh, uh, high, I mean, whether it is highly contrast over or low contrast. What we need to know is only the location of the tumor. So we can use a low-resolution CT scanner. So this does not replace for a high-resolution CT scanner. And then we have uh, uh, other modern machines. So this entirely shows you the entire gamut of uh, IGRT mechanisms used in today's modern radiotherapy technique. This is a proton treatment machine, which has a small nozzle, but there is a huge 200, uh, in fact, one acre area of land that is used to build a cyclotron to produce this proton. So it cannot be easily installed into a uh, pre already existing metropolitan city with lack of uh, lands, basically. So uh, this proton therapy is, has got very limited applications. The differences between proton and X-rays are protons penetrate to only a few centimeters of depth, whereas X-rays and gamma rays, they penetrate through and through. So you have the added disadvantage, supposing you're treating a tumor which is located three centimeters below the skin, and you have lots of other organs beneath the tumor. So if you throw, if you throw a radiation using X-ray, then you're gonna obviously in, inevitably treat, sh shoot radiation onto the organs which are lying below it. In such a scenario, when you shoot radiation using protons, it can go to the particular depth and can get completely absorbed. So such, this situation is very advantageous in treating medulloblastomas, where you need to treat the CSF-containing zones of the spine without affecting the spinal vertebral column. So there you shoot radi radiation, it goes and treats 
up to the level of the spinal cord and not below it onto the vertebral body when you throw a posterior beam pro projection. That's where uh, proton therapy is useful and it's also useful in skull based tumors where you have brain stem sitting immediately beside the tumor, tumor targets. Fine. So the, uh, while the, whatever I have said is t uh, typical uh, 2D cores, along with that I have talked about 3D cores. So modern radiation technique it requires obviously a CT scan to locate the tumor target because we are going to throw radiation in multiple other directions than the standard anterior, posterior, lateral or probably known directions. When you choose an awkward direction or an unusual direction, obviously you cannot use an X-ray anatomy to understand where the tumor is because we would have studied only an anterior X-ray anatomy, posterior or a lateral X-ray anatomy. We wouldn't have studied any other directions anatomy. So it, it is, it's, it's quite difficult for us to find out the tumor in an oblique direction or in an awkward direction. That's where CT scan comes in. CT scan can project an image in any direction we want and it can tell you which direction probably has the least amount of organ at risk in the path of the beam. So that's how it enables us to choose the exact direction in which we have the target seen clearly without uh, treating the OA, uh, organ at risks. This is a typical CT scanner which we use in our department to take the CT scan which is used for IMRT planning, IGRT planning and all the other SBRT or SRT planning. What we do basically, you could have seen many of our radiation oncologists sitting on the computer quite 50% of their time. But what basically they do is they delineate the tumors exactly and also delineate the other organs at risk. So this is a pelvic tumor, this is a lung tumor. This he's using, uh, the oncologist uses PET information or any cross-sectional information. In fact, in future we can even have an hypoxic marker which will tell you which part of the, which areas of the tumor will have more hypoxia or probably more resistant to classical chemo or radiation technique uh, for an unresectable tumor. So accordingly, we can throw more dose into that because of uh, efficient, uh, accurate techniques we have nowadays. Fine. So this is quite beyond the today's understanding. So I'll skip this part. This is just a video to show, a video to show how radiation is being thrown onto the body. So this probably is not important to you. It shows how it get, it's getting thrown on the machine. Linear accelerator, the word means Electrons are linearly accelerated over this and then hit on a target. It produces X-rays. That is what is linear accelerated. So patient is made to lie on the couch. We usually do a marking on the patient body. This is what produces the irregular beam. And this is a dynamic beam. It is the shape of the beam is moving as the radiation is on. So when you throw an anterior direction beam, blue color shows lowly irradiated region, yellow color highly, and red one is a uh, therapeutic dose region basically. So you throw it in different directions, ultimately the intersection of which is sitting on the target. So the remaining regions, probably the femoral neck, other regions, receives only blue colored doses, which means low doses. So this is how we are able to avoid OAR doses, I mean higher doses to the OARs and more doses to the target. So with IMRT, you will have more number of directions, more number of fields, that's what it means basically. So in a typical field, this is what you get. Too much of dose everywhere, skips, uh, spilled over everywhere. In an IMRT field, hot spot, I mean the red zones are only within the tumor, whereas the blue zones and other zones are way outside, which shows that we have a better uh, accurate accuracy in using IMRT techniques. Okay, now coming on to the brachytherapy. Now that we have seen how radiation can be thrown from outside into the target, thereby producing adequate amount of dose. In fact, there is no term called an absolute radio resistance. It is only clinically radio resistant. Any tumor can be killed with 200 gray or any amount of dose. The dose of RT is usually prescribed in terms of grays. Grays is nothing but uh, joules per kilogram. So you should not equate it to a exact dose of chemotherapy. Because if you try to equate it in those terms, then the best comparative parameter is when you talk about, let's say, docetaxel 75 milligram per meter square, you might be delivering at 100 milligram. So radiation is not that 100 milligram. It is that 75 milligram per meter square which you have prescribed. So when I say 70 gray, I mean only 75 milligram per meter square in chemotherapy equivalent terms. So the absolute dose what I deliver differs between patient. But in common parlance, I'll say 70 gray. Because 70 gray produces 70 joules per 100 kilogram, uh, per, per one kilogram of the tumor. A patient having one kilogram of tumor, I have to throw 70 joules for 70 gray. A person, person having half a kilogram of tumor, I can only throw 35 joules of energy to produce the same 70 gray. So that is where it differs. So you should not equate it in absolute terms. Now that radiation can be delivered from outside. If I can produce the best conformal technique, which is obviously I throw the radiation directly into the tumor. So conformal in the sense, I don't throw any other dose other than the tumor. So obviously I put in hollow catheters into the patient target site. This is a patient of soft, soft tissue sarcoma. A patient had been operated and interoperatively we have placed hollow catheters in the tumor bed. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to connect these hollow catheters into this machine, which houses a small radioisotope. 
which is of around 2 to 3 millimeters in diameter. It, and then switch on the machine after coming out. So obviously, I am the most protected, radio protected person in any of uh, medical field. So because I'm going to come out of the room and then start the machine. So the source comes out, goes and stays here, irradiates the zone, the tumor cavity probably. Obviously, we can't see it from here. We'll have to do a CT scan and then see where exactly it is going to do one. So that is called CT treatment planning system. And that software costs one crore. So we have to invest that. It also is used for IMRT and IGRT planning. So then, I mean, the cost of it has to suggest you the importance given in treatment planning. That, that's why I wanted to inform that about that. Fine, OK. The tumor uh, bed has been irradiated adequately with each catheter. So you don't have to have multiple isotope. The sm small isotope, one single isotope, can come and run into each and every, of the, every one of the tubes and then complete the entire treatment course in probably one day. So now that I can fractionate the treatment, if I fractionate what is going to happen, probably instead of giving all dose at one go, I can divide it over a period of time, especially when there are important organs sitting around this region. Obviously, in the peripheral site like thigh, there are no important organs, organs. So I can easily finish off the course in probably two, three fractions. I don't call it cycles of just as we do in chemotherapy, we call it in fractions, basically. This is a patient of vulva, which I had done interstitial brachytherapy. I had inserted the same hollow catheters. And after uh, I, I put it on all this in the OT, I bring out the patient and then do a CT scan and then try to find out how much of dose I need to throw inside, connect the catheters onto the machine, and then start the treatment. This patient has actually received a brachytherapy, and she has developed some hypopigmentation reaction, which are quite common in high dose RT given to a local site. Fine. So that is just a glimpse of what brachytherapy can be. Brachytherapy, there are different types of brachytherapy. It involves a separate uh, discussion on that. Uh, we'll not go on to that. The idea of brachytherapy is you're going to give radiation directly into the tumor rather than from outside the tumor, passing through the skin, subcutaneous tissue, all the other organs. Fine. So this is megafield radiation. Megafield radiation is, has currently not been used anywhere except probably as a conditioning regimen before we do a stem cell transplantation. So megafield is basically any, any, any field that is not conventional. A conventional field, or rather a CT uh, linear accelerated, can produce a maximum of 40 by 40 centimeter size of the field. Now, how am I going to treat the whole body using that 40 by 40 centimeter? Obviously, instead of keeping the patient on the couch, I keep the patient on the floor so that I can have an effective distance of two meters. Or if I need to have more distance, I can even make the patient stand aside four meters away and then rotate the machine onto the side, just as this is done. So this beam, as it comes out, it can produce 40 by 40 centimeter size at this center of the machine region. And it can produce almost a four meter coverage. So this is how I'm going to do total body irradiation. So doses, parameters, the technical aspects are all quite different between total body irradiation using x and total skin electron therapy using electron, uh, electron treatments. The basic difference is, why do I say total skin electron and not say total skin irradiation using photons? Because electrons, as similar to protons, penetrates to only few centimeters below the skin. So obviously, if I shoot ra radiation using electrons, it is not going to go into the lungs of the chest, or it is not going to go into the pelvis, affecting the bladder as well as the rectum. It is only going to penetrate into few centimeters below the skin. So I can even choose the range. Suppose I give a 6 million voltage electrons, it can penetrate only to, to the maximum of 1.5 centimeter. It doesn't go beyond that. Practically, it gets absorbed anywhere beyond that. Even if you put an instrument to measure the dose inside the lung for this patient, if I'm throwing an electron, you'll practically get zero dose. So that is how effective is electron. And that is why electrons are used to treat surface malignancies. So best example is a cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, especially a systemic type, where you'll have to treat the entire skin of the patient's body, which is at risk. So total skin electron therapy and total body radiation are quite similar. Techniques, doses might differ. So doses, if you, are asked, if you, would, if you would be asked in the exams, you can say 14.4 gray in eight fractions is what is given in total body radiation technique. It can differ between institutes based on their experience. 14.4 gray in eight fractions, which means 1.8 gray I give in the morning, and then again, I repeat it again in the evening. I do it for four days. So entire total body radiation is complete over this uh, four-day treatment. And then after that, you can do the uh, transplantation. And engraftment is usually achieved by 20 days or 25 days. These are, again, different techniques on different directions we need to throw radiation. Probably all these are te technical details, which is beyond uh, your understanding, probably. So this is uh, uh, another patient who is receiving total body radiation. He has got a small, uh, fine, I think this is not working, fine. Uh, just before the lungs, he, got, he has got some metal stuff sitting in front of the lungs. This is just basically to shield the lung 
so that lung doesn't receive too much of doses. This was actually practiced when they were doing single exposure of total body radiation. When you do a single exposure of 10 gray to the whole body, lungs have to be blocked. Otherwise, he will die of interstitial pneumonitis rather than getting uh, rescued for a TBA, TBA regimen. So that is why lung blocks were used. I think these are all more, more of technical details which may not be of use to you. I'm just giving you to have an understanding. A modern technique that is coming up for the use of, thank you. Modern technique that comes for the use of whole body radiation is we don't need to treat the subcutaneous region, skin, all the organs that are inside the body for conditioning the patient for a stem cell transplantation. What we need to attack is only the marrow. So the target here is clearly the marrow. So there is a technology available to treat only the marrow and to avoid any other organs inside the body. The, that particular machine is tomotherapy. Tomotherapy does covers the entire body without affecting any of the organs at risk or probably throwing very less doses to the brain, to the lungs, to the abdominal organs. So total marrow irradiation is what is being practiced nowadays. So you can safely give high amount of dose probably. Here, it, in fact, they have given 16 grays. I told you 14.4 gray is what is used on a typical TBA regimen. They have stepped up to 16 gray. In fact, higher doses are usually required for halogenic bone marrow transplant. For autologous transplant, lower doses are more than sufficient for a good engraftment. So TMI is an advanced technology which enables to treat only the marrow or not any other organs at risk. So this is probably very important for you, the radiation fields that are used in lymphomas. Historically, there have been different names just as they have given for the uh, in fact, the pathologists have started labeling it as starry sky, blue sky, green sky, any sky, uh, depending, just for common parlance sake. People in radiation field have also used different terminologies like mantle. Mantle is just a lantern carried, so it's just a shape of a lantern. So this, you can see, probably older ancient uh, medieval period lanterns or some other period lanterns. It looks like a lantern, basically. So this covers the cervical node, axillary node, mediastinal node. So that's the mantle, typical mantle field. And this is an, in, in fact, the different names given are extended field, inverted Y field, so many other fields are given. All those have become irrelevant now. Why? Because we have coned down our approach. We are not treating wide fields. In fact, chemotherapy has replaced almost all these large field irradiation. Before the era of effective chemotherapy regimens, entire lymphoma, uh, the lymphomatous disease was handled only by radiation. So only in, at that era, we were using radiation to treat all the uh, possible uh, diseased lymph node zones. So now we try to cone down. After chemotherapy has achieved its job in reducing the entire uh, tumor burden, we only shoot radiation to the residual disease, or probably we reduce the intensity of chemotherapy and then compensate it with a local uh, treatment regimen so that uh, additive toxicities of chemotherapy can be safely avoided. So in fact, the principles of management in lymphoma, or for that matter, any solid tumor should be combining the optimum proportion of chemo, radiation, and surgery. It should not be uh, with an intent of replacing surgery, or replacing chemo, or replacing RT. So we need to find the right proportion of combination, which, di which is dictated by the tumor biology uh, of the particular tumor. So in this scenario, all these have become relevant, as I told you. So this is a technique which we follow commonly now. This is more like in involved site RT. Earlier, we did involved field RT. Supposing a patient of cervical uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma, let's say stage 2 disease, bilateral cervical region, with a bulky site on one side. You would have irradiated both this neck and then added a boost to the residual disease on the involved side neck, residual disease neck. So that was a typical regimen. Nowadays, instead of treating the whole lymph nodal region, because uh, a, a level 2 or a stage 2 Hodgkin involved bilateral cervical region, we don't have to treat the entire level 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 on either side. We only locate the levels exactly which was having the initial bulky disease. Say, supposing if the patient had level 2 node and level 3 node, level 4 and 5 was not involved. Probably we can safely avoid irradiating the level 4 and 5, which was done in an IF, IFRT setting. In an ISRT setting, we only treat the involved site. A further cone down approach is INRT. We treat only the involved node. So to, so to say that, in, in the level 2 region, only the nodal volume is contoured and irradiated, not the remaining part of the level 2 region. If you delineate the entire level 2, it can extend posteriorly, anteriorly to cover a significant chunk of volume. Only the node is irradiated, but IN, more than INRT, IF, ISRT is safe because if there are two nodes sitting in level 2, let's say around 2 centimeter apart, we don't have to shoot radiation specifically to do two different nodes. It is always safer to include the entire level 2 than treating only this because the in, uh, there is high probability of subclinical disease in the space between these two gross nodes than uh, in fact, because of the high probability, we need to cover it using an ISRT technique. Right? 
I hope you would have grasped the concept here. Now, having talked about lymphoma, breast, head and neck, cervix, the most common cancers, it could have covered almost 80 percent of your solid tumor oncology. Coming on to other common fields used in multiple myeloma, CNS lymphoma, some other areas. Multiple myeloma, the radical treatment or curative approach is only reserved for a solitary plasmacytoma or an extra medullary plasmacytoma and not for a multiple myeloma. Multiple myeloma is a systemic disease. Radiation is a localized treatment or a, at the maximum local regional treatment just similar to surgery. Whereas uh, systemic treatments are reserved for systemic diseases. So multiple myeloma involving bones, we shoot radiation only to the involved sites to produce palliation. Palliation can be for pain or to prevent future bone related events. So bone related events are, it can include pain, fracture, neurological problems or any other compression related issues. So we shoot radiation from the posterior side, we make the patient sit uh, lie down prone, shoot radiation from posterior. If you shoot uh, x-rays, the x-rays are going to pass through the vert spinal cord, vertebra, probably if there is heart, if it's a thoracic uh, bone, it could have been heart, it could have been lungs. If I need to shoot radiation only up to a particular depth, what kind of uh, radiation I should I use? Protons, exactly, just as we do in medulloblastoma. So protons or even electrons. Protons have got a deeper depth when compared to electrons. Electrons at the maximum 4 centimeter of depth from the skin. Protons can be uh, thrown as much as deeper as we want. But then the cost of proton therapy is 200 crores when compared to a 10 crore or a 6 crore linear accelerator, which can uh, treat almost 80 percent of our Indian cancers. So this is a typical field which we uh, use to treat the whole brain. In fact, uh, in PCI setting, prophylactic cranial irradiation, our intention is to treat the CSF containing zones and sometimes the uh, brain parenchymal tissue also. So we treat, the, this field is used to do a prophylactic cranial irradiation, a therapeutic cranial irradiation if CSF is positive in a patient of uh, a lymphoma, uh, leukemia. Again, the same field is used for a primary CNS lymphoma as part of the De Angelis protocol, so where we throw 45 gray as the dose. In ALLs for PCI, we usually throw 12 gray or 18 gray, depending upon the protocol for ALL that is being used in, uh, in treating the patient. And obviously, for brain metastasis, we use the same field. We need to, uh, the target region for brain metastasis is, is the entire brain parenchyma. The CSF is not the target over there, so we will treat the entire brain parenchyma to prevent future progression of the disease as well as to reduce the number of new metastases that could form. Fine. Now coming on to the most important slide which probably might be useful to you when you monitor patients who have received radiation and come to your department for further treatment. These are all the toxicities which you expect. Obviously radiation is a local original treatment as I told you. It depends on a patient of head and neck cancer complaining of bleeding per rectum. Radiologist does a CT, I mean we send a, a CT scan reference to the radiologist and then he reports probable evidence of radiation induced proctitis. That is highly unacceptable, fine. Because radiation is a local original treatment, it can only produce toxicity in the local set. Just because you have the list of uh, etiology, differential diagnosis of radiation proctitis in a patient of proctitis, you should not jump up and then say it could be a radiation proctitis. Of course, there are systemic reactions to local radiation treatment, but that's mostly cytokine mediated and will mostly result in fever or other hypotension, other related parameters, which is common only in a mega field irradiation, not to a small field irradiation for a head and neck or a cervical cancer. So obviously radiation produces toxicities in the uh, rapidly growing regions, which is the surface. It can be the outer surface, skin, or the inner surface, any of the linings, luminal linings. All the luminal linings, depending on the site where you radiate, you will be getting acute inflammation that can result in all this phenomena. Obviously, lung alveolar lining can result in pneumonitis, and then raised ICT, intracranial tension, and then fever is a systemic response to local RT. Sometimes nausea and vomiting is also systemically mediated. They may not be patient receiving uh, uh, let's say uh, RT to a large region of the shoulder might also get nausea and vomiting. It cannot be attributed to a local side effect, of, which is very obvious. Fine, this is a uh, skin that is peeling off. It's, called, it's a grade 3 reaction. If it is bleeding, if the entire epithelium is denuded, then it becomes grade 4 toxicities. I have not put in a picture of mucositis because you would have seen patients on concurrent chemotherapy on head and neck cancer would have come to you. They would have had all the mucosid, uh, various grades of mucositis you have seen. These are all partial yeah. So which only says that radiation has passed through this, in this direction and this direction. It has definitely not passed in this direction where hairs are left out. So it's very obvious to demarcate. Even here you see there is a clear demarcation of the inflamed skin versus the normal skin, which shows that radiation is thrown on either tangent 
the sites. So only uh, skin reactions have developed over. This is a patient post uh, lumpectomy receiving whole breast who had received whole breast RT. Fine. So when you have a clearly demarcated skin reaction, it is mostly caused by uh, radiation rather than uh, chemotherapy. Chemotherapy will have probably a systemic, uh, widely varied toxicities. Fine. This is again a patient of uh, chondrosarcoma of the chest who has a positive margin. So we went ahead and treated his chest wall, and he had had a dry skin, which is a, a typical late effect of radiation. This patient is quite unique. I'm sorry for not uh, obscuring the patient's eyes. Uh, this, as you can, can anyone predict what type of radiation the patient has received? What could be the possible diagnosis? This is a prophylactic cranial irradiation. Patient who has received prophylactic cranial irradiation, I don't know the exact diagnosis, probably an age, I don't know at this age group, it's not common. I'm not too much into hematology. But this is a typical German helmet radiation. As you can see, the patient has got the eyes shielded off from the toxicity. There is no toxicity around periorbital region. There is toxicity on the temple region, and then it goes behind the angle of mandible. So which is very typical. The, in fact, wherever the radiation has penetrated through, the patient has developed a skin toxicity, which is highly unusual. This never happened in any of my patients. But then this one in probably, uh, I don't know, uh, is yet to be reported probably, is a highly exaggerated skin reaction seen in low dose PCA. We usually get, deliver only 12 grays. And for a, even for a grade one, a grade two reaction, you need to deliver more than 20 grade to the skin to produce a grade two reaction. So it is quite, we can put it under an exaggerated reaction, probably a drug uh, radio sensitizing effect of the chemotherapy that has been delivered to the patient. This is a healing stage. Patients have had a grade 3 reaction and then she has completely healed. She has re epithelization has happened. And this, again, there is a re epithelialization. Hyperpigmentation is quite common, which will usually settle down. Patient doesn't stay black forever in his life. It will usually come back to normal stage. And then the chronic side effects. These are all the disturbing side effects for our patients, adverse toxicities for our patients. I'll probably finish in another two minutes. Again, surface lesions. Uh, probably acute effects are more on the revealed on the surface. Chronic effects uh, they happen much uh, a little below the surface. That's why you get lots of fibrosis everywhere below the surface. So dermatitis, subcutaneous fibrosis in the face, neck region, and the breast region resulting in tightness of breast, groin region resulting in contracture, perineum, al and sometimes alopecia. Chronic alopecia can also do happen. It's, it's quite rare uh, for uh, patients. Submucosal fibrosis, not mucosal level fibrosis. Fibrosis typically happens in the submucosal level. Probably they say radiation has, uh, induces more of TGF beta expression and all those fibrogenic factors. Uh, I don't go deep into that aspect, which basically results in killing all the salivary glands if the patient has received head and neck radiation, xerostomia, esophageal stenosis, if there is cicatrization, submucosal fibrosis of the esophageal lining, and any uh, luminal region can have a cicatrization leading on to stenosis. It can be a rectal stenosis, it can be a bladder contracture resulting in a, a, a small bladder. Vaginal fibrosis and stenosis can completely uh, occlude the entire vaginal cavity. Interstitial pneumonitis can be a very devastating complication and also cardiomyopathy. Curative doses, okay fine. So this probably may be useful to you because this is what uh, examiners might want to probe more. In, uh, in fact, they would want to reveal their knowledge of radiation on this aspect than other aspects. Is that a time limit for me? I hope you don't attribute this to radiation related toxicity. <laughs> Fine. So curative regimens usually typically range of, should I hold? Fine. Curative regimens typically we deliver radiation more than 60 gray. The dose that we deliver depends basically on two parameters. One is whether there is increased incremental response of the tumor to dose and other one is whether the dose that could be delivered safely is limited by the nearby organs at risk. So in these tumors, oral cavity, adenic tumors, pelvic tumors like cervix and prostate, we are able to throw more than, in, in fact, up to the level of 90 gray. In head and neck, 70 has been proven to be more than sufficient to produce can cures. Cervix and prostate, we step up to 90 gray because there is a significant dose response relationship for cervix and prostate. This is uh, throwing dose more than 60 gray is quite a challenge in pelvis using the typical two dimensional technique. That is where we need to step in for a IMRT treatment or an interstitial brachytherapy. I think the scope uh, dis discussing that is beyond our scope now. The tumors that can be cured in the thoracic region and abdominal tumors are mainly limited by the organs at risk. 
So we have lungs and heart sitting in the thorax which cannot tolerate more than 50 gray. And then lots of intestines in the abdomen which cannot tolerate more than even 45 gray. So it becomes a technically challenging task for us to deliver radiation into the abdominal cavity. Despite that, we are able to achieve relatively better cures in glioblastoma, esophagus, lung cancers, tracheal malignancies, soft tissue sarcomas, especially when it is undesectable despite chemotherapy or even neoadjuvant radiation and uh, bladder carcinomas for organ preservation, rectal cancers in some areas where it becomes... Ladies and gentlemen, your attention please. An alarm has been activated. We are investigating... Fine. So, anal cancers, a typical Negro regimen where we throw 50 to 60 gray and, uh, along with chemotherapy. And skin cancers, typically 60 gray is more than enough. And palliative regimen, we usually throw more than... Uh, the tip, uh, for a curative regimen, we usually give 2 gray per day only once in a day. We don't give more than once. And for TB, I said we'll give more than once in a day. That's called secluded or specific regimens. In general, if you're asked how many times does, does a curative regimen patient receive RT, it's once in a day. So eight grain, one fraction, all this can be given in palliative setting. This is, we are throwing eight grain a single fraction. We are throwing four grain single fraction, three grain single fractions for all, all these regimens. This corresponds to the entire adjuvant treatment dose. Adjuvant in the sense, an uh, added uh, treatment modality alongside the definitive that is producing cure. So obviously in all head and neck ca cancers, we throw up from 50 to 64 gray depending on the uh, pathologic risk factors like PNI, uh, e uh, extra capsular extension, positive uh, margins or uh, multiple nodal involvements, all those are uh, risk factors for that. In sarcomas, we throw up to, especially pediatric sarcomas, uh, when there is a residual disease or when it's an inoperable site in the pelvis or in the meningeal region, we throw up to 54 gray for RMS and Ewing sarcoma. Lymphomas, we have toned down our doses from in Hodgkin's up to 18 gray now, and for non-Hodgkin's up to 30 gray. And retinoblastoma, 40 gray in a radical set, either in a radical setting or in an adjuvant setting. Both, uh, since it is quite radio sensitive, we throw up to 40 gray. And this is for the uh, craniospinal radiation. In fact, that uh, again requires an extensive discussion, uh, which is beyond our scope now. I'll skip that. Blastomas, all other chemosensitive, extremely chemosensitive tumors are also radiosensitive. So obviously, a lesser dose is more than sufficient for uh, adjuvant treatment protocols. Whole abdominal RT, 10.8 gray, lung bath is given in Wilms tumor or in uh, Ewing sarcoma sometimes. Total body radiation, I told you, 14.4 gray, 12 gray, depending on the uh, institute that we practice. This is just a concise uh, view of how radiation is. You can try to compare it with others. It's almost a century old practice. It is curable in most of the solid tumors, uh, or at least as an adjuvant modality after a local uh, treatment done with surgery. And toxicity is usually local original, as I told you. And the duration, typical duration is six to eight weeks. Probably in another 10 years, we'll bring this down onto one week or two weeks using SBRT techniques, in, uh, which will be replacing the entire conventional mode over a period of time. Repeatability, at the maximum, I can repeat radiation to the same site twice, especially if it is uh, not covered by, uh, especially if it has an organ at risk. Like, supposing I need to repeat radiation to the rectum after the patient has recurred in a neoadjuvant setting and surgery, I can throw more dose only with an IORT setting, intraoperative RT setting. I haven't discussed about that, I just, just to understand. And as far as chemotherapy, you'll have second line, third line, fourth line or as many lines as possible. Because the varieties, there are lots of varieties of options. You don't use the same drug again and again. You try to alternate and uh, use molecular drugs and other systemic drugs. Varieties are limited here. The uh, ones that are available in India are X-rays, gamma rays from the cobalt isotope. X-rays are basically produced by electricity. You switch on the electricity, you get X-rays. Switch it off. So there is no uh, risk of bi uh, biologic radiative terrorism in using X-rays. Whereas when you use cobalt, there is always risk of uh, biologic terrorism involved in it. And electrons, we can we do use. Protons, I think, in Apollo and uh, in uh, National Cancer Institute in Jajar, they are trying to install protons nowadays. Heavy iron, we don't have any center in India. It's only uh, available abroad. Fine. I think with this, I can close it. I have not talked about the radiobiological aspect as well as the physics aspect, which is quite, uh, will prolong the entire discussion for a lot of Britain. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Jagadish. That's an excellent coverage of the very extensive field. Quick questions before lunch. We are already running 30 minutes behind, so we'll have a very short break for lunch. All of you have to run and eat lunch and come back. Any quick questions to sir? Because I'll be leaving.
they have achieved irradiated fatigue now. Irradiated and now ready for lunch. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll thank you. Quick lunch. 15 minutes. We'll be back.